Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Hello and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host, Jimmy Aiken, our guest. And we won't be taking calls today because uh, we've got all the questions in already. Internet uh, questions have come in, and we'd like to have uh, bring those to Jimmy Aiken from time to time, and that's what we are going to do today. So, uh, Jimmy Aiken, of course, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers and the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Hello, Jimmy Aiken. Hello, Cy Kellett. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, how do people get these questions to you? Uh, people can find you on the internet, I guess. Yeah, they can. And sometimes they email radio at catholic.com and they forward them to me. Sometimes they email me directly and I log them. Other times I, I, I'll put out a public appeal for questions, either on Facebook or on YouTube. And that's what I did for this episode. So we're going to be having a lot of questions from folks on YouTube. All right. Very, is, is YouTube, I can't remember, is that a you use your own name or you make up a name on YouTube? You Are we going to have a name. All right. So we'll be having some interesting names today. Uh, I will probably be tempted to give out the phone number, but uh, there won't be anybody on the phones today because uh, we are pre-recording with lots of uh, questions that have already come in. I'll, I will say this, though. Often, uh, these are very interesting shows, uh, because just uh, for the very reason that uh, we kind of... Jimmy gets to curate the questions a little bit. We get to... Um, be choosy in the questions we get, and so sometimes fascinating questions come in uh, on these. It's an open forum of the internet variety today, and let's uh, start. We'll start with Jason Thayer, 1309. How was it determined that seven is the age of reason for receiving communion? Well, it's not the age for receiving communion uh, in e in many Eastern Catholic churches where they practice what's known as pedo communion. Uh, paida means you know child, and so pedo communion is given communion to infants. And in fact, in many Eastern Catholic churches, it's the norm to give all three sacraments of initiation to infants. So you baptize the infant, you confirm the infant, or chrismate the infant, and then you give the infant communion. And personally, I'd be in favor of the Latin Rite doing that. But the Latin Rite has chosen a different path, and it's chosen to uh, typically give communion around the age of reason. Now, when that is, is not strictly seven years old. It varies from child to child. Some children hit the age of reason earlier than seven years old, some hit it later than seven years old, and unfortunately some people who suffer from mental disabilities never hit the age of reason. What the age of reason is, is the point in life at which one has a clear grasp of the difference b between right and wrong to such an extent that one can determine if a particular course of action is going to be mortally sinful, and one can either freely choose mortal sin or to resist mortal sin in a fully human way. You know, you're not under a psychological compulsion of immaturity or things like that. And there hasn't been an official church teaching on when this is, but uh, based on, you know, just common anecdotal perception of the human experience, it seems like a lot of children go through a notable mental transition around the age of seven, where they're able not only to distinguish right from wrong, but to distinguish uh, between gravely sinful actions and other actions in a way that they are, have full, you know, voluntary control of. And so, kind of by the common estimation of men, seven has been regarded as a typical age of reason, but it will vary from individual to individual, and it's, and it's not certain, you know, it's up for debate. If someone wanted to argue that seven-year-olds don't typically have this degree of moral insight or degree of freedom, one could argue that. But mm -hmm. it, this is the common estimation that has been used. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I have some uh, sad news. Neither of the computers in the studio is working uh, today. So you're going to have to read the next question, Jimmy, and I'm going to have to go find another computer or I can't okay. read any more questions. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, this is this is why being a radio professional and showing up early and making sure all the systems are working is always a good thing. Um, but the next question is from Comacross, and it says, can you explain how the Byzantine Catholic Church Church is fully in union with the Roman Catholic Church. Sure, no problem. It's pretty straightforward. So the Catholic Church is those Christ consists of those Christians who are in full ecclesial communion with the Pope. The Pope is the ecumenical center of the Catholic Church, and so if you're in communion with him, then you are in you are part of the Catholic Church. You're also in communion with all of the other people who are in communion with the Pope. And so the Byzantine Catholic Church is, so-called, is one tradition within the Catholic Church that has its own, uh, you know, historical and legal heritage. The Roman Church is, uh, or the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church, is another group of people in the Catholic Church who have their own legal and historical tradition that they belong to, but they're both in con they're both in full communion with the Pope, and so they're both in full communion with each other. In fact, <clears throat> the definition of schism in the Code of Canon Law is a refusal of submission to the Roman Pontiff or the refusal of communion with those who are in communion with the Roman pontiff, and therefore, uh, if you weren't in communion either with the pope or with others who are in communion with the pope, then you would be in schism. You would be separated from the Catholic Church, and that's not the case with the Byzantine Catholic Church or the Roman Catholic Church. Come across, thank you very much uh, for the question. The next one, and, and we're going for, I don't know if it's a record, but uh, it's probably pretty close to a record. Three questions before the first break. Cam Gaylor wants to know this. Can you explain what the, what the gift of tongues is? I have met Catholics who pray in tongues who are a part of the charismatic Catholic renewal. Yeah, so there are a number of different theories about what the gift of tongues is, and one point I need to make is we have to distinguish between the gift of tongues as it's presented in the New Testament and the gift of tongues as it's manifested in church history. Because one of the things that the congregate, then Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith pointed out a few years ago in a document on charismatic gifts called Euvenescit Ecclesia, if I recall correctly, um, is that the, none, of the, none of the lists of gifts of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament are exhaustive, and the Holy Spirit also can give new gifts in different ages of the church. So he's not confined to just a set of things that existed in the first century. As things have changed in church history, he can give new gifts if he so chooses, because he is God and he can do what he chooses. In any event, in there have been a variety of different understandings of tongues that have been reported. One theory, and I'll, I'll kind of mention theories that I don't think correspond to the biblical gift first, but one theory is that it's not really so much a gift of speaking as a gift of hearing. That is, you know, uh, you can be talking in one language, let's say English, and someone will hear you in Swahili, and so if they're a native Swahili speaker. I don't think that actually corresponds to the way the New Testament presents the gift, but if the Holy Spirit chose to have that happen later in church history, he could certainly do so. Another theory that is particularly common today is that tongues do not correspond to an actual language that's in use anywhere, that instead it's a private prayer language between you and God, or perhaps it's a language that angels use, but um, I also don't think either one of those is what corresponds to the New Testament usage, because even though the, Paul, as a hypothetical case, mentions, I mean, what if I could even speak with the tongues of angels? I don't think he's really a certain that angels have tongues or languages. They certainly don't have physical tongues, and they don't really have a need for language, because not any kind of humanly 
speakable language because they're spiritual creatures, they're created intellects, so they don't have bodies, and therefore they communicate telepathically. And so um, that wouldn't result in a vocalizable language that angels use with each other because vocalizable languages depend on making sound vibrations and listening to those sound vibrations, and angels don't have any need to do that. So I don't think there are angelic tongues in that sense. Um, when it comes to a private prayer language, well, that's an interesting suggestion, but it's not what we see evidence for in the New Testament. In the New Testament, what we see is people speaking in real human languages that can't, that they don't know, that can be understood by people who do know those languages. And so, for example, on the day of Pentecost, when the um, apostles start speaking in tongues in front of the crowd, the, they're speaking in different languages, and the international crowd of Jewish people from all different countries that have different languages, they recognize at least one of the apostles or early Christians who are there are speaking in their language, even though they're all Galileans. And so their native language is going to be like Aramaic. Maybe they would speak Greek, but they're not going to speak all the languages that this of the lands that this crowd came from. This is the natural understanding of tongues that you would come to based on just the way the New Testament describes it. The word tongue either refers to the physical organ in your mouth, or it refers in Greek and in English. It refers either to the physical organ in your mouth, or it refers to the sounds that you produce with that physical organ. In other words, your language. And so even today, we could speak about, do you know the English tongue, or the French tongue, or the German tongue? And that's the way it's being used in the New Testament. Having said that, if God wants to give people a private prayer language today, he can do so. Um, I would just want to see evidence that that's what's actually happening, as opposed to people in some situations thinking they have the gifts of tongues when they may really not. Um, I'm sure G God does still give the gift of tongues today, but uh, as it was in the Bible, but um, I think some folks think they've got it when when they actually don't, and it, it could be their imagination, there are actually ways to sort that out, because uh, you can take samples of tongue speech and play it for linguists, and they can look at the tongue speech and see, does it bear known characteristics of real languages, or does it seem to be a hodgepodge of different things that don't actually correspond to the way someone uses a language. And my suspicion is in some cases it's going to be legitimate tongues, and in some cases it's it's going to be someone's imagination. Cam, thank you for the question. It brings us to the first break right back with more questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. We're here for you. Call now. Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Magnificat. Published monthly, Magnificat features texts of daily mass, prayers, articles, meditations, art commentaries, and more in step with the liturgical rhythm of the church on the web at magnificat.com. Unplanned, the true story of Abby Johnson. I would be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. She believed in a woman's right to choose. I've had an abortion myself, so I don't have any problem with another woman making the same decision. Until the day she saw something that changed everything. Tiny, perfect little baby. And then it was just gone. Now she's pulling back the curtain on the abortion industry. Unplanned. Available at EWTNRC.com and the EWTN app. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kellett, your host. Delighted to be here with you and with Jimmy Aiken, Senior Apologist here at Catholic Answers. All the questions have come from the internet uh, today, and so you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the questions and answers. This one comes from Rosie Girl 2485 My nan, 
the Guts grandmother, who was a sweet Southern woman, always said to us kids about having children, if you pencil them in, hon, you will never be able to afford them. Just have them, and somehow it all works out. Well, there's not a question there, but I assume that Rosie Girl wants my impression of that. And my impression would be that there's an element of wisdom there, that a lot of people get too hung up about, oh, can we afford children? And what changes are going to are they going to make in our lives? And is this the right time? And, um, and they end up not having kids or not having near as many as we need because we need a certain number of kids in order to maintain a stable society. We need an average of 2.1 births per woman. And even though we're not at the bottom in terms of our replacement rate of, uh, of the population, we are not where we need to be. We're below 2.1 children per women on average. And a lot of, uh, I think a lot of that is caused by unnecessary worry about well can we afford a child and and can we uh is this the right time to have one my attitude is if if you're married and you're in your fertile years don't sweat it too much go ahead and have kids now there's also a question of how many should you have and there can be reasons for limited the number of kids you have at a certain point you know it's reasonable for people to you know not have further children and that's understandable but uh but i agree with uh, rosie girl's nan that uh that a lot of people worry about this too much and don't uh trust in the in providence and their ability to adapt i'm not advocating a, a providentialist position of you know just have kids without giving any thought to the subject but i think that there is an excessive worry about do we have all the pieces in place that we're going to need right now or you know can we work some of those pieces out like where the where the funding is going to come from for different things as the child grows up and has different needs so um so i i broadly speak and agree with rosy girls nan but uh but you know i would like to see some nuance in terms of the actual application of the principle Rosie Girl, thank you very much uh, for letting us know what your nan had to say. Dylan uh, says this. Yes, Jimmy, can you adopt me and my grandpa? No, actually, you missed a word in there. Can you adopt me? Oh, yes, I apologize. Yes, Jimmy, can you adopt me and be my grandpa? Yeah, um, well, I don't know what actually United States law has to say in this regard. Dylan, for purposes, since you say grandpa rather than parent, I'll assume that um, that you've got parents right now, and you're not asking me to adopt you as a parent. Um, it's interesting, there were procedures. Now, I'll also assume, Dylan, that, that you're a legal adult. That may or may not be the case, but I'll assume you are. Um, well, in U.S. law, I don't know the details of, but I know under Roman law, it was possible to adopt another adult. And this was commonly done, for example, in families that didn't have a male heir to carry on the family line. And so, what would happen is a, a an adult would adopt another younger adult to become his legal heir, and this was called adrogation. And so we see this happening even in the imperial family in Rome. Um, the first emperor was Augustus, and he did not have any children who survived and would be suitable as heirs. And so when... Uh, what he ultimately did, and there's a long tangled history to this, but what he ultimately did was he adopted the son of his wife Livia, a man named Tiberius, who was a man. He adopted Tiberius and made him his heir. Actually, Augustus himself had been adopted by Julius Caesar before he became emperor, but then he adopted Tiberius to become uh, his heir and thus emperor. Uh, later on, uh, the emperor Claudius adopted uh, the son of his fourth wife, Drusilla, uh, or sorry, Agrippina, um, the younger, who was the mother of Nero. So he, had, Claudius, adopted Nero to be his heir, and we we see this practice of adopting people, even who are legal adults, for purposes 
of continuing family lines as something that actually happened. Uh, whether some such a thing would happen in America, and especially with asking me to be your grandpa rather than your pa, <laughs> um, I don't know that U.S. law has a provision for that, but it's a very kind thought anyway. Dylan, uh, thank you very much. It is an open forum of the Internet Variety Today, or an Ask Me Anything of the Internet Variety Today. Chris wants to know this. Actually, it's Chris DH3JF. Uh, in a video, I heard you say that the evidence for the exodus was high, but not so much for the conquest of Jericho. If this is true, how can we understand scriptural inerrancy in light of this? It seems to me that the author is asserting that the conquest occurred, and I think that the author could not have any errors in what they were asserting. Thank you. Well, I'd agree that uh, the as Dei Verbum from the Second Vatican Council asserts that everything that's asserted by the sacred authors is also asserted by the Holy Spirit, and therefore it's true. So I don't think there's any error in what's being asserted in these texts. Um, however, there's a difference between what the ancient author is intending to assert and what we might think he's asserting based on a modern real a modern reading of the text without its historical context i also think you may have misheard me um because I, I i do think the evidence that an exodus occurred is high i think it's good um and i think that you know a conquest of the territory including jericho that also happened uh so i don't doubt you know, the conquest of Jericho. What I have questions about, though, is the degree of precision that we should try to read out of either of these accounts, because these accounts were uh, are of events that occurred well before the keeping of court records in ancient Israel. They were not yet a united monarchy, so they didn't have court recorders writing down everything that happened. And as a result, what you find when you study the way history is written in the Bible, the earlier you go, the more general it is and the more reconstruction is involved in presenting historical events. And then when, and that's especially true in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, as Pope Pius XII acknowledged, they use simple and metaphorical language to communicate truths about history and the human race. Then when Abraham comes on the scene, it starts to get more definite. And then when you get to the United Monarchy, where they have actual court reporters, you know, who are recording stuff, it gets even clearer. And then in the New Testament, it gets clearer yet, where these events are written very close to the to what's being these books are being written very close to the events they describe but with the exodus and jericho those are two events that are in this middle period after abraham but before the united monarchy and so we would expect a certain amount of generalization and reconstruction and figurative language in them. And, you know, we don't have evidence, you know, that Jericho's walls fell down. So I would tend to look at that aspect of the text and say that's a symbol of how God gave the Israelites conquest over Jericho. It's depicted in this way. Uh, the conquest was real. But we don't archaeologically have evidence of the walls actually falling down. And I would just take that as a symbol of what God did for the Israelites, that he gave them complete victory. Uh, Chris DH3JF, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. This one comes from Nathaniel. As a Protestant, one thing that I think disproves the notion of the Catholic Church is the existence of corruption in past popes. If you could apologetically address this, I think that would be really cool. The seat of the Vicar of Christ does not seem to have a moral high ground to me. Well, in terms of its occupants, I'd certainly agree. There have been some terrible popes in history, um, people who had very immoral behavior. But just because someone has immoral behavior, that doesn't mean that they don't have an office that God gave them. Uh, for example, if you look at the history of the Israelite priesthood, and I'll need to finish this on the other side of the break, but if you look at the history of the Israelite priesthood, 
Um, you know, God appointed Aaron and his sons to be priests. And yet in that first generation of priests, two of them, uh, two of Aaron's sons were actually killed by God because they they did immoral things. They were uh, they they were offering unholy fire uh, at God's altar. We're not exactly sure what that means, but that's what we're told. So even then you had people who had been given an office by God who did immoral stuff and God punished him for it. We see the same thing a few generations later in the time of the prophet Samuel, where the high priest at the time was a man named Eli, and he had two sons who Eli did not correct. Uh, they were doing things, we're told, like eating unauthorized portions of the offerings that the Israelites were bringing, so they were taking stuff for themselves they weren't supposed to. That was the equivalent of stealing from the collection plate. We're also told that they were sleeping with the women who served at the tent of meeting, which is the equivalent of sleeping with the church secretary. So they were doing bad stuff, and God punished them for it. And he punished Eli for not correcting his sons. But they still had offices from God, and there's more to say about that, so I'll say it on the other side of the break. Nathaniel, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, Looking forward to hearing the rest of it on the other side. We'll be right back with more questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. What was the church like in its infancy? In a word, Catholic, and Joe Heschmeyer has the receipts. In his best-selling book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, he gives you the details from the historical records of the first two centuries of Christianity. Right now, get a copy for just $10, plus free shipping if you live in the continental United States. Get more information and order The Early Church Was the Catholic Church at theearlychurchwascatholic.com. Is orthodoxy an alternative to the Catholic Church? In a time of uncertainty for many Catholics, orthodoxy can look like greener pastures. Answering Orthodoxy, the new book from Catholic Answers Press, explains why Catholics who are thinking of leaving need to think twice. There are important reasons to remain in the Catholic Church and convincing answers to orthodox claims. Order your copy of Answering Orthodoxy today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Is the Catholic faith still a rock amidst the waves of history? Why does it so often seem to be a mess? In his latest book, Confusion in the Kingdom, best-selling author Trent Horn helps you to get to the roots of the present chaos, explaining the destabilizing movements within Catholicism and exposing the harm and scandal progressive Catholicism has caused. Order your copy of Confusion in the Kingdom today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Well, you just never know where that groovy music will pop up. Thank you, Darren, for a little bit of groovy music. Jimmy Aiken here. All the questions have come from the Internet. Nathaniel's question, Jimmy's in the midst of answering. Uh, His basic concern as a Protestant is the corruption of popes uh, would suggest that they don't have a divine office. And Jimmy, you were in the middle of addressing that. Yeah, so I've I've just given a couple of examples of people who had divine offices that God had granted them, and yet they went on to do bad things. Now, the particular examples I cited, two of two of Aaron's sons and then Eli and his sons, they were ones where God got mad enough that he killed them, and so they didn't continue in office. But there are also examples of where someone who has an office that God put them in continues in that office. So whatever they did, it wasn't bad enough that they got killed, but it was it it it, it so it didn't stop them from from exercising their office. An example of that is the high priest at the time of Jesus, at the time of the crucifixion. His name was Joseph Caiaphas, and we see him in John chapter 11, having a meeting with the Sanhedrin, and they're debating what to do about Jesus, and 
Caiaphas is afraid that Jesus is a political revolutionary, that he plans to start a rebellion that's going to cause the Romans to uh, come in and stomp everybody and destroy the temple, um, which was a worry at the time, because it had been destroyed before. The Babylonians had done that. And the Romans certainly have more might than the Babylonians did. So if they get a real bee in their bonnet, they can come in and destroy your temple. And so Caiaphas, in this meeting, says, uh, don't you see that it's better for one man to die, meaning Jesus, than for our nation and our holy place, meaning our temple, to be destroyed? So he proposes killing Jesus in order to end this problem. And John, the inspired author, tells us he didn't say this. So before I tell you what John says, let's think about this for a second. Here we have the high priest who is encompassing the death of the Messiah. He's proposing we kill the actual Messiah, who happens to be the Son of God. You know, he's he's divine. He's God. He's proposing we kill God. Now, he doesn't understand all that, but what he's proposing is objectively really bad. It's a really immoral thing he's proposing here. Um, and yet, John, the inspired author, tells us that he didn't say this on his own behalf, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the, for, for the people. Okay, well, that tells us he, if he's prophesying because he was high priest that year, that tells us he's still exercising his God-given office even though he's he's using it to propose something objectively wrong. And so uh, here we see an example of someone who has an office and is doing bad stuff and yet is still exercising that office and, in fact, is divinely inspired as he's doing it in a, a kind of weird way. Even though he's what he's proposing is wrong, God's going to use it to bring about good, and he's allowing him to prophesy this. Then we come to the very first pope, Peter himself. Now, all of the twelve abandoned Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, and we read about that in all four of the Gospels. Um, Peter, in particular, denied Jesus three times, which Jesus had predicted he would do. Also, in one of the Gospels, it says that when Peter was challenged about whether he was a follower of Jesus, he began to curse. Well, that doesn't mean what it would mean today. When today we talk about people cursing and we mean they use bad language, you know, cuss words, that's where the word cuss comes from, is curse. So if you're using cuss words today, if you're using bad language or tabooed language, then you're, you're cursing. But that's not what the word that's not what it meant in the first century. In the first century, to curse meant to invoke something bad on someone, like may God do this bad thing to someone. And so who is Peter cursing here? There seem to be two possibilities. One possibility is that he's he's calling curses on himself. He's saying something like, if I'm a follower of Jesus, may God strike me blind. Okay, well, maybe, but then why didn't the text say he began to draw down curses on himself? Because it doesn't say that in Greek. It just says he began to curse. And it doesn't say he was cursing himself. And so that has led various scholars to propose that he's actually cursing Jesus, and the evangelist is being delicate in how he says that. And so um, so that's a real possibility. But whatever you think of that, he's, he's denied Jesus three times, and that's bad. But it does not stop him from continuing in office. You know, Jesus had appointed him as the head apostle. That's very clear. Even Protestant scholars, many of them will admit that. So um, he did require Peter to, you know, repent and publicly reaffirm his love for him three times. Uh, we see that in John chapter 21. But Peter continued in office. And even though Peter had done bad things, 
Peter ended up being one of the inspired authors of the New Testament, and he wrote two infallible encyclical letters. They're in the back of your New Testament. They're called First Peter and Second Peter, even though he was a pope who was profoundly flawed. Well, okay, that establishes the principles we need. Uh, if there are meant to be later popes, and I think there's good evidence that there, there are meant to be later popes, then they would be on the same model as Peter, and the same principles would apply to them. Even if they did bad things, that wouldn't stop them from having an office that God had given them. God might judge them for misuse of office, like he did with Aaron's sons and with Eli and his sons, or he might not. He might leave him in office and let him continue to uh, to continue to serve in that office the way he did with Caiaphas and Peter. We have to leave that up to God, what he's going to choose to do, though. But the fundamental principles that applied to Peter would apply to later popes, too. And you can't just say, oh, there have been some corrupt popes, therefore the papacy is invalid, because then you'd have to say, well, Peter was corrupt, so he can't be an authoritative author, and we ought to cut his two inspired encyclicals out of the New Testament. Nathaniel, I hope that that was helpful uh, to you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, getting the question to us. Uh, this next one comes from uh, Joseph Kamau, who's in rural Kenya. And uh, hello, uh, Joseph. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. You, you used his actual name that he put in the text of the question as opposed to saying his, his YouTube handle because it's easier. Well, the, the, I don't know exactly about the YouTube handle, but I just thought uh, the interesting <laughs> thing to me was that he was from rural Kenya. So I wanted to okay. make sure I got that in. And, okay. and since he included his full name there when he said that, I thought it would be okay to read his full name. But his, his uh, YouTube handle is U 6 I think. U 2 Six, something like that. I'm not sure. Hello, he says, I always enjoy your insight on controversial topics on faith. Did Mother Mary die in Israel or in Turkey, and has her grave ever been identified? Well, to tell you the truth, we don't know. At least um, I have yet to find any convincing case for the answer to this. Um, what we do know is that at the crucifixion, Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to the beloved disciple, the author of the book of John. And there are, and so we can infer that at least for some time after that, uh, she remained in his care. And we, we can see that because he tells us that. He says that from that point on, the beloved disciple took her to his own, meaning treated her as a member of his own family. So we can infer that she was with the beloved disciple for some time. Now, the beloved disciple is identified as John, and I think that's right, but there is a question about which John are we talking about, because there was more than one John. In fact, there's a bunch of Johns uh, in the New Testament, but there are two particular Johns that are famous as eyewitnesses of the ministry of Christ in the first century. One of them is John the Apostle, who's the son of Zebedee. The other is known as John the Elder or John the Presbyter. Presbyter just means elder. And people differ on this. There are different views. But for my money, um, I think the beloved disciple is really John the Elder. I think he was a, a member of the Jerusalem aristocracy. And we actually see that in the Gospel of John, where um, he gets, he, the beloved disciple, gets Peter in to the high priest's house after Jesus has been betrayed, because we're told that the disciple was known to the staff of the high priest uh, and to the high priest himself. So when he goes over, after Jesus has been arrested, when he goes over to the high priest's out, the servant girl recognizes him and just lets him in. And, but she stops Peter because she doesn't know Peter. And so um, so the beloved disciple then intercedes for Peter and says, oh, no, go ahead, let him on in, it's okay. And she lets Peter in. Well, okay, it would be very unlikely for John, son of Zebedee, to be on a first-name basis with the high priest and his household staff. You know, this indicates that John had been, the, the, the beloved disciple had been over to the high priest's house multiple times in order to be known by him and his staff, you know, so they could recognize him. It's very unlikely that a Galilean fisherman 
would uh, like John, son of Zebedee, would fit that profile. And it's even more unlikely that um, that a Galilean fisherman who was business partners with St. Peter would be known to the high priest, and yet St. Peter hmm. wouldn't be known. Because as business partners, you would expect them both to be known to the same groups of people if they had, say, business dealings with them. But they really didn't because they're from up in Galilee. They're not down here um, on a regular basis. So I think that and other factors point to John being a native of Jerusalem who is a member of the Jerusalem elite that was on first name basis with the high priest so i would say john the elder rather than john son of zebedee is likely the beloved disciple well okay um one of the things we know about both john son of zebedee and john the elder is they both went to ephesus in modern turkey and that's where their graves are there are graves of two prominent johns in ephesus and uh, so a tradition arose, since we know the Virgin Mary was in the care of the beloved disciple, whichever way you go, um, it's been proposed she went to Turkey, and that's where her tomb is. And there is even a, an apparition that claimed to identify which house it was. But apparitions are private revelation. They are not archaeological evidence. Um, there's also, though, a competing tradition that says Mary died in Israel, in fact, in Jerusalem, and on the Mount of Olives, just across from the what used to be the temple complex, there is a proposed tomb of Mary there, too. Both tombs are empty. But we have these two competing locations for where Mary died, and, and one of them's in Israel, one of them's in Turkey. There have been proposals for these are sites connected with her, but I would say the truth is we really don't have certainty here. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much uh, for the question, uh, Joseph. And that'll take us to the break, actually. We'll take a very quick break and be back with lots more questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Hello, this is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco. Keep your dial tuned to Catholic Answers Live. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. This is Jim Pinto director of EWTN Media Missionaries. EWTN's mission is to spread the eternal word and to teach others that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. You can help EWTN share the good news by becoming a media missionary. Visit EWTNmissionaries.com today and join us in sharing the eternal word with the world. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. It feels like about a million questions. Is it just me, or does it feel like Jimmy's on a roll today? Yeah, all right. Uh, it's what, only been eight. It's only been eight? Well, that's all, yeah. almost a million. There's a few more, and we'll get to a million. Uh, Jesus uh, asks this question. Uh, what would people in the Old Testament have to do in order to be forgiven by God? If one could time travel to the past during the time of Christ, Presumably, there's an infinite number of unique timelines. Would there be many versions of Jesus? Oh, this is different questions. All right, given the fact that in the multiverse, there is only one God. Okay, so let's take the first question first. Uh, what one would do in the Old Testament in order to be forgiven by God would be the same basic thing that people do today. Repent. If you repented of your sin and you told God you were sorry and you want his help to avoid doing it again, and especially if you do that based on love of God or charity, you definitely been be forgiven. Now, um, there were specific ways that people would 
handle certain kinds of sins, like they might offer what's known as a sin offering at the temple. Um, but that wasn't an absolute. This was a common and approved way of expressing sorrow for sin. <clears throat> There were also other ways of doing it, like putting on sackcloth and ashes as a sign of sorrow for sin. But these are externals. And as the book of Hebrews points out, even if you offered a sin offering, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So that was an external act that signified your repentance. But it's different than the repentance itself. And so the fundamental thing you needed to do was repent. Now, today... We have um, a benefit in that we have efficacious means of obtaining forgiveness, so that even if your forgiveness isn't based on love of God, uh, if it's just, say, based on fear of punishment, you can still be forgiven. So there is a difference today compared to then, but the same fundamental condition of being forgiven for a sin is repentant of the sin. Uh, then... In regard to the second question, well, okay, so he says, would if one could time travel to the time of Christ, would there be different Jesuses in different timelines? Because there's only one God in the multiverse. Well, it's true, there's only one God. And if there's a multiverse, then God acts in all the different timelines of the multiverse in one way or another, if nothing else, by creating them and maintaining them in existence. But we don't know that there's a multiverse. So that, and we don't know that there, certainly don't know that there's an infinite number of unique timelines. It may be we're living in the only timeline that exists. Personally, I'd, I'd be a little depressed at that, but, you know, I'd accept it because... The truth is, I don't have proof of the existence of other timelines. What I can say, though, is that there are an infinite number of possible universes. And in that infinite array of possible universes, meaning universes that God could create if he chose, there the incarnation happens in an infinite number of them. And so there would be slight differences in Jesus and what he chose to do in these different possible universes that God could create. Um, but th also there would be an infinite number of universes where the Son of God did choose to cre to incarnate. And so there are an infinite number of slightly different Jesuses in the array of possible universes, but there's also an infinite number of possible universes where Jesus didn't incarnate and God would have handled those in some other way. The question then would be how many and which of those infinite possible universes did God choose to create? We know he created this one because we're living in it. Beyond that, it's a matter of speculation. And some people today will say we have scientific evidence for the multiverse. That is not true. Um, we don't have scientific evidence for the multiverse. Whoops, a little bit of a technical uh, problem there. I'm sure we'll get Jimmy back in a quick second. It's, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's aliens interrupting because of uh, Jimmy talking about scientific, the lack of scientific evidence for the multiverse, but uh, it is always aliens, so maybe it's aliens. I uh, have taken over the equipment, and uh, we don't have Jimmy for a quick second. Uh, you're listening to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken is our guest, and all of our questions have come from the Internet uh, at the moment. And uh, th thank you very much to those who gave us the questions. Jesus had asked uh, Jimmy about uh, if, you, if one could time travel in the past. Oh, no, excuse me. This, he's on to the second question. What, uh, would there be many versions of uh, Jesus if there were an infinite number of unique timelines? And that, that's what Jimmy is in the midst of answering answering at the moment, and unfortunately, uh, we lost him. So I'll tell you what, I'll read the ad. I never read the ad earlier, uh, so just go to, sh if, if you're interested in uh, Catholic Answers materials, if you'd like to buy books and uh, gifts and all kinds of things. we got a whole uh, store there now. It's not uh, just the bookstore that it used to be. Lots of wonderful books, of course, but also merch 
and uh, religious items and a whole bunch of stuff, just go to shop.catholic.com and you can find all of it. Shop.catholic.com. And I can almost guarantee you there's a sale going on because there's almost always a sale going on of one kind or another. Shop.catholic.com. That's where you can go uh, to get all your needs met uh, of, of the, um, of the uh, purchasing variety. Uh, I, can't, I can't say you can get all of your needs met there, but uh, you can find all the stuff you need. If you're looking for Catholic stuff, is what I'm trying to say, you can find all the Catholic stuff that uh, you want. It's an open forum uh, this hour, or actually now we call it an Ask Me Anything. Jimmy Aiken is our guest, and all the questions have come from the internet. One way you can get those uh, questions to us is just sending send it here to radio at catholic.com. All we do when we see those questions come in for Jimmy, we just forward them to Jimmy, and he puts them in the collection. You can also uh, reach out to Jimmy through his various uh, social media. Jimmy, very active on YouTube, and that's one of the places where you can uh, contact uh, Jimmy. Just go check out his stuff on YouTube and uh, go that way. Or I think he's still on Facebook. He's on all kinds of places. So uh, find him and uh, locate him there. Jimmy, of course, the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which comes out every Friday morning. You can get a new episode of Jimmy Aiken's uh, Mysterious World. Uh, each Friday morning, uh, just go to mysterious.fm or just search Jimmy Aiken's, Mysteri- uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on your machine. Type it into your machine. Mach- your machine will get you uh, there. Uh, I almost gave out the number, but I'm not going to give out the number. Uh, you can. Uh, oh, by the way, that that uh, if you, if you go to ra- uh, uh, radio at catholic.com and send us an email, you can also join Radio Club. And Radio Club is a place where you uh, can be. Beca- we have a weekly Radio Club email that goes out. All kinds of cool stuff uh, in in that. We all, including surveys, and we appreciate that. At least twice a year, we sur- do a survey, and that's material that we use online. If you'd like to. Get weekly materials from the radio club here, uh, and if you would like to participate in things like surveys that we do that we use on air, um, sometimes you, we will ask people to participate in the game show, that kind of stuff. Just go to radio at catholic.com. No, no, just uh, the, it, just send an email to radio at catholic.com. That's what I uh, intended to say. Send an email to radio at catholic.com, and you can become a member of Radio Club. I think that we have uh, Jimmy back with us, and uh, he's in the midst of answering if there would be many Christ's uh, if there were many timelines. Uh, Jimmy, I, I think we got you back. Uh, you want to uh, conclude what you were saying? Yeah, sure. And that was an amazing uh, display of radio professionalism with that vamp there, Si. <laughs> I thank you. Um, <laughs> in, any, in any case, uh, so I was just wrapping up the basic point. There are an infinite number of universes that God could create. In an infinite subset of those universes, Jesus did incarnate, and there would be slightly different versions of Jesus. But in a in a separate um, sub infinite subset of those universes, he chose not to incarnate. The question would be, how many of those universes did God choose to create, and which ones did he choose to create? That's something that we don't know the answer to. We can't deduce that philosophically, and we can't deduce that scientifically, so I'd say we have to leave that in God's hands. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, let's go to a real quick uh, uh, Kiara's question. Can you explain the errors of premillennial, premillennialism? Sure. So premillennialism is a view that we are currently living before a period in time that's known as the millennium. The millennium is a period that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. It's described as a period in which Christ reigns and the saints reign with him, and the devil is bound in such a way that he can't deceive the nations anymore. Now, um, in the view of premillennialism, we're living before that time. That's why it's called pre-millennialism. Um, there are other positions as well. The Catholic position typically would be that we're living in the millennium right now, that uh, Christ is reigning from heaven with his saints, his church is also reigning here on earth, and the devil is bound in such a way that he can't deceive the nations, he can't stop the proclamation of the gospel, which is why, um, uh, you know, a, th- a third of the global population identifies as Christian, and half of the global population worships the true God. This is vastly different than it was in the first century when the number of Christians was a tiny, 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 tiny minority swallowed in a sea of pagan darkness. 
So that's the basic the basic mistake of premillennialism is interpreting the book of Revelation as if almost all of it applies to our future. That is not well grounded. I've published a number of things on that. You might want to check out some of our 20 Answers books on the end times and the book of Revelation, for example. Kiara, thank you very much uh, for the question. Thank you to everybody who has sent in their questions. We've got a lot more for the second hour. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. It's Ask Me Anything of the Internet Variety, and the Internet provides. Uh, that, that we can count on. If you ask the Internet, it'll give you questions. Some of them will be smart aleck questions, but you will get questions. More of that right after this on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.